So number one, think hard about learning. Now why do I said that? Well I said these discussions that I've had with teachers about things like, so I've, I've, I've done hundreds of talks now since we started doing the, um, the toolkit, uh, putting graphs up like this, and the ones that get people going are the class size and the teaching assistants, without fail, um, because people don't agree with me, or they don't agree with the evidence, I suppose. And what comes out of those is, um, for me, is that so much of what teachers are focused on, and the whole education system is focused on, is actually nothing to do with learning. It's all about managing behavior, it's about compliance, it's about uh, getting lots of work done, it's about making their eyes shine and their you know, enthusiasm, it's about um, giving them attention. You know, I've marked their books, so they must have learned something. All of this stuff, it's not about learning. And, and that's a problem because you can't see learning. So you have to use proxies like this to, uh, as a teacher, inevitably you use proxies. Of course you do. But I think we need to be better at that and we need to be better, more, more willing to acknowledge that that isn't the real thing. There's some really interesting work. If you haven't read Graham Nuttall's work on this, New Zealand researcher, not much of it is available, unfortunately. It's all in academic journals behind paywalls. Um, uh, but he's written some really interesting stuff, observational studies in classrooms where uh, every child is mic'd uh, and recorded and they'll do interviews with the teachers and say, what, you know, what do you think your students learnt in that lesson? And uh, almost no match between what they observed and talked to the students about what they actually learnt. And, and things like that um, almost no overlap between what different students in the same room actually learnt in the same lesson. Really interesting studies. We, it's just so hard to know. I mean, I, you know, who's learning anything from listening to me? None of you, I'm sure. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> um, it really is very hard. So, just to keep it simple, it's always good to be simple. Uh, here's a test. Learning is mostly about thinking, and thinking hard is the thing. So, if I'm by some way making you think hard, then you might be learning, and if I'm not, you're probably not. And that's the same in your classroom. Where is the hard thinking happening? How many minutes in a day are your students spending thinking, thinking hard? Um, and do you like it when they think hard? You know, thinking hard means being stuck. Are we comfortable with that? Because then they start misbehaving. So it's much better to give them something easy. So that's number one, that we, we need to, if, if learning is what we care about, we've got to actually focus on learning. Keep the main thing the main thing. Number two is about professional development. And this is embarrassing for uh, a profession that is supposedly about learning to value its own learning so little, I think. Uh, just to give you an example, it, the kinds of things, if we want stu our students to learn hard things, kids in classes, we, oh, you can't, read that at all, can you? Sorry. But then, you know, you explain stuff, you model it, you pract they practice, you give them feedback and so on. When we want teachers to learn stuff, we just tell them, you know, here's what assessment for learning is like, this is what you do, off you go. Doesn't work, doesn't change practice. It's much, much harder than that. And um, there is some research on this, it's not great and it's not extensive, but for example, if you follow the research, if you were to be evidence-based in your thinking about this, you would never do any professional development that lasted less than 15 hours. Because the research show, if we're talking about having an impact on your students' learning, as far as I'm aware, and I'd love to be corrected about this, there is no evidence that any CPD that's lasted less than that has had any impact on student learning. So that's three days, isn't it? Three days solid. And not three days together, spread out. And three days is a minimum. Ideally, 50 hours. That'd be 10 days. Or, well, might be more. You focus on what it is you're trying to teach. You've got to be able to try things out and, and do them. And you need somebody else to feed back to you, somebody outside. One of the problems with CPD, when I talk about 15 hours, sometimes schools will say, yeah, we do that. You know, we have um, meetings within the school where we talk about ideas and uh, okay, that might be great, 
but you need this too. You need somebody outside. Otherwise, the danger is that you're just recycling a whole lot of bad ideas. How do you know that you're not doing that? Uh, I mean, you might be anyway if you've got an outsider. It's not a guarantee, but um, it's a concern. And then, of course, you have to be learning to do something that is actually likely to make a difference, even if you do manage to implement it. So don't spend your time on um, you know, all the things that, that Tom Bennett writes about, the, the brain gym, the BAK, and the neuro-linguistic programming, and all that stuff, because it doesn't matter how effectively y your CPD was, you wouldn't learn. So there's a whole issue then. How do we change the culture of CPD? I don't know, but that's a big one for me, because as a, you know, the, the way teachers are trained initially, and I can say this as someone who works in an a, a organization that, that does that, I think on the whole is pretty abysmal, and the opportunities for ongoing professional development from that point are probably even worse. And uh, it wouldn't have to be like that, I don't think. Okay, number three uh, is that we need to evaluate teaching quality. So there are ways that we can judge who's a good teacher and who isn't. This might be more, in fact, this will be much more controversial. I think if you haven't disagreed with anything I've said so far, I think you're about to. I'm hoping you are, because I hate it when people agree with me. Um, in fact, Tom, if anyone was in Tom Bennett's talk, he said, what's the new brain gym? You know, what's the thing that we're all doing now? Because it's, you know, and he did this a bit in his talk, I don't know if others heard that. Um, it's kind of, oh, we don't do that VAK nonsense, you know. But, I mean, lots of people f saw that the first time and thought, well, that's clearly flaky. Um, and I know some schools are still doing it, and some teachers, and it's, it needs to be killed dead. But it does feel like, certainly for an audience like this, of, of enlightened people, that's a bit of a soft target. You know, that's a bit of sort of, we're all great together, and uh, thank goodness those other idiots, you know, those other idiots are doing this, but thank goodness we're not. Okay, but here's something that you're probably doing. Uh, which I think is brain gym, and that's classroom observation. You're all doing that, aren't you? Observe, observation by colleagues and by inspectors. Who, who doesn't ever do that? Okay, so I've got you all. Fantastic. Right, so if you were an evidence-based professional, would you be doing that? Where is the evidence that says observing one teacher, observing another teach, leads to improvement? Can anyone tell me if there is any? Okay, well I'll tell you what I think. The two kinds of evidence I would like to see before I would want to be uh, committing effort to uh, an, a program of observation as a, as a strategy for improvement. There might be other reasons you do it, but if what you're kidding yourself is that you're improving the quality of learning that's happening in your school, uh, what kind of evidence would you need? Well, I think you'd need two kinds. One is about validity. In other words, if somebody sits in your lesson and makes a judgment, can that judgment be trusted? If they say that was a good lesson or that you're a good teacher, are you really? So that's the validity evidence. And actually, there's quite a bit of research on that. And it mostly shows that the kind of uh, homemade uh, observation, well, every, any teacher can observe a teacher type thing that most schools do. Tell me this isn't true. I don't know. Maybe you don't do that. Um, you know, you're a teacher. You know what's good teaching. You can sit in someone else's lesson and observe them. Actually, that kind of observation has almost no validity. You, you can't. You cannot tell. Uh, your judgments will not correspond, for example, with another teacher's judgments. And uh, they also won't correspond with other things like uh, learning gains on assessments. So if you, if you assess children at the beginning of the year and they have a teacher teaching them stuff and then you assess them at the end of the year, we know from good research that with some teachers, children will make more progress than they do with others. Now, I'm not saying that's the definition of a good teacher, but I am saying that an observational judgment should at least correspond to some extent with that. It shouldn't just be completely independent. So those amateur judgments of, of common sense and, and yes, of course, I can do this, actually don't work. They're not valid. And then the second kind of evidence, so, yeah, okay, sorry. That's the, that's the thing on that. Those are the kinds of questions that you'd want to ask. Does it correspond with other things? Is it consistent across occasions, across raters? So if you rate me 
uh, on five different occasions, would, would you give me ratings that are similar enough for you to be able to say, yes, you're a good teacher? And what about all these kind of confound? You know, if I just happen to be, tell some good jokes and seem confident, will I get high ratings, even though I'm not actually teaching anyone anything? And so on. Or if you happen to observe me teaching a, a really challenging class, and then you observe me teaching a, a really biddable class, would your judgments be confounded by that? Because I'm the same teacher. Surely I should be the same. Or should I? You know, let, let's talk about that. Maybe I shouldn't. Okay, and then the second thing, so that's the first kind of evidence, validity evidence. And as I say, there is some of that, and it mostly says that what most people do isn't worth doing, isn't right. So that's not evidence-based, definitely. The second kind of evidence I'd like to see is, this would be experimental studies. This would be a randomized control trial. Could be one way. It's not the only way, it's probably the best way. So here's, a, here's a, a, a strategy, a program of observation. This is what you do. You train observers this way, you observe this many lessons, you feed back to the observed teacher in these ways, and you support them uh, you know, responding to that feedback, and so on. So you'd specify what the intervention is, and then you'd say, well, does it lead to benefits? Well, does it? Do we know that? Again, there have been some great blogs about uh, observation in the last month or so. Not one of them seems to have talked about this question, though. That, for me, that's a really interesting gap. Really, you know, clever, insightful people, teachers on the whole, asking about what, how observation should be done, um, nobody's asking about this kind of evidence. I'm interested in why that is. As far as I'm aware, there's not a single study that shows that a specific program of observation leads to benefits in students' learning. But I would love to be corrected on that. So do let me know if you know of any. Okay, actually, I've got five seconds left, but I'm going to just overrun slightly my 25 minutes. There'll be uh, questions in a second. Oh, dear, sorry. Shouldn't have put that on. Right, uh, number four, this is the most important, that whatever we do, we have to evaluate it, and the reason we have to do that is because most of the claims, or certainly a large proportion of the claims, many of the claims that are made about school improvement are not true. My school improved, or at least it may have improved, but the, why did it improve? So I've listed a whole load of, of fake claims that people could make. If you were uh, being paid money as a consultant to go into schools and you wanted to convince people that you'd earned your money, these are some of the things you'd say or do. So, um, you know, s fluctuation from year to year, you pick, start with a bad year, it'll just go up. Uh, don't collect proper evidence about assessment. Just ask people if they think it's been good or not. And of course they'll say yes. Um, schools who are willing to work on something are probably going to go up anyway. Uh, yeah, poor quality evaluation. Again, we know that that's one of the reasons why doing um, randomized controlled trials is, and those sorts of studies is really important. Because lower quality evaluation is more likely to give positive results, and they're false positives. 